Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler is very excited to present today's program as part of our World Arts Local Lives digital programs. This is the third in our Disrupt the Fowler series. Disrupt is a UCLA student design organization that aims to establish inclusive spaces and provide opportunities for students of all backgrounds to engage in creative collaborations. The Fowler is honored to partner with Disrupt and offer programs that break down barriers in the art world and promote innovative ideation through inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Today, Disrupt will be represented by Amy Fang, who is currently a senior in the UCLA Design Media Arts Program. As a woman of color in the creative industry, she is interested in using graphic design to express hybridity, exploring cultural convergences in language and identity. We are so pleased to be speaking today with Denise Ariana Perez, a disruptor in the field of photography. Her work, such as the Men in Water series, addresses the fluidity of masculine identity. Denise identifies herself as a people photographer and provokes her viewers to dive deep and challenge the public consciousness. By depicting a vulnerable balance between her subjects and their environments, Denise rewrites the narrative surrounding the idea of masculinity. Denise is a Caribbean-born, Copenhagen-based copywriter and photographer. Her photographic work gives a face to culture, highlighting the beauty of marginalized groups that she feels inspired by and connected to, such as Afro and LGBTQI plus communities. Her photography has been featured in a variety of publications, including The Guardian, El País, Vice, Afropunk, Dazed, Ignant, Marie Claire, and Accent Magazine. She currently works as a freelance senior creative and is represented by Probation Agency London as a photographer worldwide. If you have any questions during this program, I encourage you to submit them via the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to hear answered by Denise at the end of the program. All right, that's enough from me. Over to you, Denise. Thank you for the introduction, Bianca, and hello to everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, I'm currently in Copenhagen, so uh, it is nighttime here. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to talk about my work and my process and to hear the questions that you might have. Um, so let's get into it. Um, for any of you who would like to look more into my work here is my portfolio, denisearianaphotography.com and my Instagram is deniseaps. Um, a little bit about myself, um, as Bianca mentioned, I'm both a copywriter and a photographer. Um, my photographic work focuses a lot on, well, it mainly focuses on people. And when I say I'm a people's photographer, I mean, I photograph not just portraits, but I photograph the body and movement and how people usually interact with nature and their, the environment around them. But particularly nature is a common theme in my work. Um, and you're gonna see that throughout the presentation. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about different series of mine and um, the first one that we're going to be starting off will be my series Albinism. And this was one of the, well, it has been an ongoing project. Um, I've done several personal projects in different parts of Africa. And um, as I was doing a project around LGBTQI people in um, East Africa, I became very curious about people living with albinism, living particularly in Tanzania. How I came 
to this theme and subject was because I watch, well, I read an article and then I watched a little documentary that Vice made and they were interviewing this albino activist from Tanzania. And he was talking about, um, well, the discrimination that they face, but also the persecution um, that they face. And there had been a spike in attacks uh, against albinos and kidnappings and mutilations. And I wanted to learn more about that. So I actually ended up serendipitously, I ended up running into this activist that I had seen in this documentary while I was in Tanzania. And we ended up meeting and talking and he invited me over um, through his organization and he wanted me to capture uh, people with albinism in Tanzania and gave me full creative freedom uh, to, to document them. Um, but for me, a big part of my work uh, is centered around not just documenting. I always say that my work is somewhere between reality and fantasy. And I focus a lot on highlighting beauty. So even though I, a story can be talking about a very serious subject like discrimination and persecution of albinos, for me it's important to use photography as a way to portray people in the most dignified way that they can be portrayed. Um, so I wanted to capture this community almost um, through a very beautiful aesthetic, but also with some elegance and, and, and also I wanted to uplift them and empower them and make them feel beautiful. Um, and I added elements of even fashion in it. Um, so here you're gonna see some of the images, for example. Um, the garments, for example, that you see in these photographs, they were in collaboration, they were done in collaboration with two designers uh, that are based in London and Paris, and they are very interested as well in utilizing fashion to tell stories of culture. So they were super excited to help with my vision and made the garments specially for the shoot. So I actually brought them, um, in this case, to Uganda. And yeah, used them for the shoot. As I said, I wanted to create almost like bring an element of fantasy um, to these very real stories. Um, these particular photos were the second edition of the series that started in Tanzania, but then they traveled to Uganda, um, or I traveled to Uganda. Um, and why I did that, I did a sequel, um, was because I wanted to learn, as you know, Africa is very, <laughs> it's a big continent, and I wanted to learn about the realities of the community in another part of the region, in another part of East Africa. And in Uganda, there was actually not persecution and mutilation also, because in Tanzania it was done be, uh, due to superstitious beliefs and there's a lot of witchcraft. Um, and it's believed that when you mutilate an albino, especially a young one, it can bring you good luck and good fortune. Um, in Uganda, it's more of a Christian country and it's more of a, less affair society. So there is more acceptance, not as much integration of albinos, but they basically don't get the support from the government. They're not recognized as um, people with disabilities. So they don't have um, free access to things that they would need. Like for example, eye care and um, eye protection and skin protection like sunscreen. So it was interesting to see the nuances between the different countries and how their treatment of albinism uh, differs. So in these photos, um, the boys that you see in the photos, they are, one is a model, one is an artist, another one is a dance hall, a professional dance hall musician, um, and the other one is um, an activist. Um, so for me, it was also important to showcase the youth, uh, um, not in a victimized way, but the youth and their, their passions and their ambitions and the fact that they, um, yeah, are just going for it, just like any young person with ambition anywhere in, in the world. 
Um, the next series is called Boys, Men and Cops. Um, this is also an ongoing series. Um, it started off because, well, something to mention about my work, I think 90% of it, um, as Bianca mentioned, it, I, it's centered around men. And um, yeah, I, I think that for me in particular, I, I grew up with, with brothers and um, with a very close relationship to my dad. Um, and I grew up in a very <laughs> macho society, um, even though that I've moved a lot throughout my life, but my childhood was spent in, in Dominican Republic. And there is a lot of, yeah, a lot of man chauvinism. And um, yeah, let's just say it is like repleted in testosterone. <laughs> um, and but for me, that's not the type of masculinity that I was interesting and in, interested in, in not only in portraying, but I got to observe men from a very from very up close from a very young age. And I could I had the chance to witness their their other sides and their vulnerabilities and their sensitivities and maybe not everything that they put on display at once. And I think that is the type of that complexity and that nuance um, portrayal of, of men is what I'm interested in. Um, and some people might say that I'm maybe imposing it on when I'm photographing onto a subject, but I think that is not imposing, it's more creating a space for them to release something that already exists in them which I know does. Um, so in this case, in this series in particular, um, a rooster or a cock is um, the epitome of the symbol of like masculinity in the animal kingdom. I mean, you would think of a lion, but also a rooster has um, that same demeanor. They walk with their chest up and they are, yeah, they're quite dominant. and. It, I noticed that it's a very interesting interaction that happens when you take a rooster and you put it next to a man and it becomes like a battle of, <laughs> of dominance, a battle of power. And first you need to catch the rooster, which in itself, it's not an easy thing to do. They're quite agile and fast. Um, so it becomes a little bit of a, yeah, like a bullfight in a way, and you need to catch the rooster. And then afterwards, once the man actually catches and ha like holds and the, the rooster, there is an exchange uh, that happens um, between the two and kind of, I call it a dance, but it's a dance to see who is the dominant one and who has the power. Um, and after a while, the rooster succumbs, but also the men succumbs. And that was the moment that I was interested in capturing. It's the submission of the two um, chest erected like man and rooster and what happened when they let go um, and how they just sort of became one in a way. Um, and then after a while, of course, the, the rooster tries to exert power again, but then succumbs again. And then eventually they give up <laughs> and it ends. But it's, um, I just found it very symbolic and um, I wanted to observe that interaction um, through different men and through different roosters and, and, and capture it. So that's how the, it, um, the series came about. These photos were taken in Uganda and different parts of Uganda. And now we have this, uh, my series called Cloaked. And this one was taken in Morocco. Um, 
Yes, this one was taken in the desert, in a desert outside of Marrakesh. Um, and in this one, I wanted to play more with texture, movement, um, the body as well, and a very different ecosystem. Um, and again, I love abstraction as well. So you're gonna notice that in a lot of my work, there is an element that might be covering a face or might be disguising um, a part of the body. And I like this, this way, yeah, of adding abstraction to the human body and creating, creating movement. Um, yeah. I also love the idea of duality. So um, this notion of these two men that um, that are partly disguised. And um, it's also very symbolic because, you know, this being taken in Morocco and um, where there's a lot of head coverings. Um, but in this case, we have men and we have them touching one another um, also in a country where that is rather controversial. So here we have, this is part of a larger series. I'm gonna show one called Men in Water, but, and this one is called Flowers and Water, but they're all part of a bigger series that is just about water. <laughs> and actually it's gonna be, I'm currently working on my first photo book and the title of it, it's gonna be Agua. So it's gonna be about water and um, an exploration of people as they interact with water and my relationship with water. So these photos, um, the series initially started um, in Senegal a couple of years, like a year and a half ago. So the, the, the series and the book, um, it, it kind of follows a journey, an aquatic journey of sorts. And um, that started about a, a year and a half or two years ago. And I was supposed to finish it this year um, in Indonesia and the pandemic, happened. So of course, I wasn't able to. Um, but it really forced me to reimagine my surroundings. And it allowed me to explore Denmark, where I reside. And it has incredible water sites. And it's actually even the city of Copenhagen, you cannot escape water. Um, so in a way, it was a blessing in disguise, because it allowed me to really look around and um, kind of tribute this journey of my journey with water, but going from the south to the north. And I think it allowed for even more contrast in the series um, and exploring water, not only in different textures, but also in different climates and how that affected the subjects. So these were taking in Denmark. And in these ones, um, yeah, it's called Flowers and Water because I wanted to interact. Um, I wanted to include an element of, oh, and another thing to mention, I mean, all my photographs, um, I style them myself and if there's a garment, I, yeah, I stylize the garment and um, I wanted to include external elements like flowers and plants into already this natural water environment. And also in this series, I wanted to, since I wanted this journey of water to be, water being so universal, um, I wanted to make it feel more universal. And um, I see myself as very much a, a person of the world, if anything. And, and um, I wanted to include women in this series and different types of women um, from different races. And um, I wanted to make it the subject matter just as universal as water. Now we have men and water. 
these were taken in Uganda. And this was an opportunity also to explore different intensities of water. So from a lagoon to a river, to the ocean, to a waterfall, which in itself, um, yeah, it, it gave a completely different, not only movement, but an intensity to the photos and the subjects. It's a different thing when you can um, have a very peaceful sort of floating um, like invocation of what water makes one feel than when you are under a waterfall and there's force, like force of nature um, that is, you know, hitting you. <laughs> uh, so that was very interesting as well to just have a more multidimensional exploration of nature, but also it's different um, like attitudes and character. Another thing about um, in my work, I think, um, is as well, I was interested in portraying specifically black men and black and brown men in a more nuanced way, as I mentioned before, uh, but particularly because these were not depictions um, that I would see depictions that were more, that show complexity, that they didn't just show um, brawn or like sexual appeal. Um, so for me, it was an intentional decision to portray um, not only a little bit, not only sensitivity, but also just complexity and just multidimensionalness. Uh, this series is called Q&A, Q for Queer and A for Africa. So this is the series that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. This, um, this was a project that I am very, I mean, the LGBTQI community is very dear to my heart and I wanted to learn more about the realities of LGBTQI people in different parts of East Africa. And as we hear that um, it is not necessarily very welcomed and it's still, um, it's actually illegal um, in most African countries to be queer. Um, I wanted to just get closer to the, these communities. And, and, and again, I wanted to portray them not as victims of these oppressive systems, but I wanted to use this opportunity to highlight their beauty and through imagery sort of empower them. Um, so I went to Tanzania, to Kenya, to Rwanda, and I collaborated with a couple of LGBTQI organizations there. Um, I when I'm working to, to capture a community, I make sure that I am, I'm doing it and I'm collaborating and learning from people who are working on the ground with these communities. Um, I think it's very important, especially as a foreigner, to come in um, first and foremost as, as a listener and as a student um, and not being very cautious of not imposing um, and really building trust and being like let in and, and letting these communities welcome you. And I think it shows in the work when there is trust in the process and it, um, I wouldn't be able to, to capture people in this sort of sensitive light if that bond and that trust was not there to begin with. Um, 
the picture on the left was taken in Kenya and Mombasa, which is um, primarily a Muslim region in Kenya. Um, interesting, interesting enough, um, this two, um, well, one, yeah, both are female identifying um, people. They were part of an LBTQ uh, organization. So they consciously took out the G um, in their organization because um, they found that the issues were too center around gay men and they were so different from the needs and, and struggles that a lot of the females or female identifying or trans people or intersex people experience. Um, so they decided to actually separate themselves and create their own organization, um, focus on those issues. Um, and this was, we had, you know, this is in a public beach. So we actually um, yeah, had passersby that um, were basically yelling at us because they were, of course, disapproving of them. Um, and so just as a, as a background story to know that there is a risk and telling these stories and also, but it, that is also a motivation to do them and a motivation to, to know that it is necessary to not only to normalize, but also to go against, um, yeah, not only bigotry, but to, to take space. Um, so in a way it was risky, but it was very empowering at the same time. Um, and they were pretty badass, like the female in the, in the bottom of the picture, she actually told me, Denise, don't listen to them. This is a free country and we have the right to do this. Um, so she was incredibly inspiring as well. Um, the one on the right, um, this was in Rwanda, which was a very different story. This was in a neighborhood in Kigali, the capital, where historically there has been a lot of queer people. Um, it's not something that is necessarily like overly ex post in the culture, but in this neighborhood, it's like a, it's a, it's a melting pot. And it has been known for this neighborhood where a lot of outcasts go and they are embraced. And uh, it has been for several decades, kind of like a queer haven. And this one is called Rocks. And again, it's interaction with nature, in this case, rocks, um, inclusion of textures and skin. And that is the last of the series I'll be presenting uh, tonight. All right. Thank you so much for taking us through your beautiful works. Um, I've seen them before, but I'm always like so excited to see them again. Thank you. Um, just reminding everyone who's in attendance. Um, so we have Q, like we have a Q and A that will be answered after we go through some of the questions we've already prepared. So if you have anything that um, you want Denise to answer, just feel free to send it in the Q and A. Um, but right now I will talk a little bit to Denise. So um, you talked a lot about your practice, but we were wondering what forms of art um, or maybe specific artists that have inspired your practice, especially, I guess, starting out. Um, I think artists that have, I think photography wise, I love I do love the work of um, Vivian Meyer. I think that she was really able to capture just human character. 
I think, in a contemporary sense. Um, I love the work of Andre uh, Wagner, who in a way, he's like a modern day Vivian Meyer, and he captures, his work feels like it was taking 60 years ago because he has a, a soulfulness that it almost, and he shoots in black and white, that it almost feels not otherworldly, but other timely. And um, his work, I think he's really able to capture human character. I think I'm very fascinated by people who are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm very inspired by film. Um, I love the work of Pedro Almodovar. I think um, um, I don't look just at photographers. I am very interested in storytelling mm -hmm. um, when it comes to writing and when it comes to film and when it comes together. So I think Pedro Almodovar is when it comes to creating beautiful, um, yeah, his visual language, um, the way he's able to use color, the way he's able to bring character and queerness, I think it's incredible. Um, and I'm very interested by words as well, because I'm a copywriter as well. So that also inspires me and like the work of Juno Diaz. I think the, the way that one can paint a picture with words it also informs my work visually. Yeah, I feel like they're really strong, like narrative elements behind all your series. Yeah. Um, have you found that like subjects will play a part in reforming narratives of your photographs, like as you're going along and in the process of taking these? Um, I always like to let Again, I go first and foremost as a student and like I, I like to allow people to surprise me. That the same with people in general that I'm not photographing. It's more of an attitude towards, um, I love when I'm proven wrong. I love when somebody shows me a side of themselves that I did not expect. So I think, yes, I can come in with an idea, but at the end of the day, when you're photographing people, you cannot fully always control the outcome because they are people. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's part of the process of dealing and engaging and being in relationship to people that you have to let go of control. So yes, I think naturally they change just because I deal with people. I don't deal with like landscapes or objects. That's so true. Um, so like usually, how do you go about choosing your subjects? It's a mixture of things. So for example, if I have a very specific, for example, when I was doing the series on albinism, then I got in contact with uh, an organization mm -hmm. um, that was, first I met an activist in Tanzania. He put me in contact with an organization in Uganda. And then I tried to do some of the work before I'm going to these places and, and make a connection. Um, but then um, let's say I know that I'm I want to photograph four men. I asked them, can you introduce me to some that are part of the organization or the collective? And then for me, it's very, it's very led by my gut. So I just know immediately when I'm attracted to a face or like someone's energy in their face. So even even from a photo, I just know already. So they can send me a picture and I will know this person together. And a lot of times since I'm photographing duos or trios, it's not necessarily about an individual. It's about, can I see them together? So that's a way. And a lot of other times it happens very organically. I meet them on the street and I engage with them and I interact with them. And half of the time I'm just interacting with strangers like I and mo I most of the time I'm traveling to these places by myself so it's me and my camera and then um a lot of interactions with strangers and um then I will just for me it's important that they I I never introduce myself camera first I introduce myself as a person and I think that is important um, especially when you come as a foreigner. I think it's important that you don't treat people or you immediately, you humanize them. I think it's important that they are not perceived or they 
feel perceived as objects that you just want to capture, right? So I come with myself first and then the photo is secondary. Um, that's very important to me. Um, and I introduce my work um, and I let them see it and it's up to them if they want to be part of it. I want them to feel like this is as much as their choice <laughs> as it is mine. And, and I think um, a lot of times when I tell them my intentions, for example, in these situations in different parts of Africa where people, um, some of them are very skeptical and rightfully so of a foreigner coming with a, a camera and like, you know, wondering if this is going to end up in some National Geographic sort of like a poverty porn sort of um, context. And once they know that my work is not about that, that it's about highlighting and beauty and empowering and, and tell, you know, changing narratives, then they become very excited. I think they want to be part of it. They feel kind of honored in a way a lot of times. So yeah. The approach to first, it's a mixture of d just fate on the streets and who I come across. And if it's a specific project, um, then a lot of times it comes through an organization sometimes. Yeah, so definitely a mix. Um, yes. So you mentioned before, like, and we've seen that a lot of your photography is centered around men and the male figure. Um, how do you think this concept of masculinity and across like different cultures, is it changing? Is it changing um, towards like for the better or for worse? Um, I think it's changing. I think for me, it is very interesting because I've actually received like negative comments of people online and accusing me of like trying to homosexualize the African men and trying to sort of um yeah to to sort of trying to promote like a gay agenda which is very far from from my intention but it's interesting that the moment that I place two men and two black men together then immediately it's put into a context of homosexuality um, so I see these comments actually as it's a reminder that there's a lot of work to be done, but it's a reminder that I must be doing something right because it's thought provoking. But for me, what is important is not what somebody sees online, like says online. For me, what is important is that I know that when I took that photo, the person who is in that photo never thought or questioned that they might look in that case, that this was compromising to their sexuality. So for me, the, the only work that I care about is what happens face to face. And knowing that for me, it's more special that I know that I took this picture in Uganda, which actually where it's criminalized to be gay. And two young men like said, were completely okay with me photographing them together without even questioning it. So I think the work, yes, can happen online, but I think things are changing, but at the same time, there's a lot of work to be done. So I feel that, I do think that is important. Like, I think imagery is important. I think that, um, I think that, yeah, I think imagery is more important than ever, I would say. And and in a way, it's even important for me to tell my brothers that this is how I saw them and see them, that I didn't see them as what they represented or they thought that they represented. So I think things are slowly changing. And I love that they're, if my photos are a conversation starter, I think that's great. <laughs> or a questioning. I've had very uncomfortable conversations with men that felt um, my photos made them question why I portray them that way and what was my intention and what do I think about vulnerability and what is strength and what is power. It's a, it has made them question what strength is. 
and how and and for me strength lies in in complexity and in vulnerability and in, not in physical strength so i've had to have these conversations as well with men that have actually come to me to question my work so i think there is change happening and but it's through conversation and like being kind of an image inviting to question one's own maybe masculinity or strength yeah i think like i mean obviously like all art that provokes dialogue is good art yeah like can you wait sorry um so how do you hope for the representation of marginalized communities um to evolve in the future um i hope yeah that they're just more nuanced i think um more than anything i think that they show range that they show beauty that they show um more than just like a mono identity i think that that's what i hope the most um let's see on to the next question um we were so like a lot of the series that you showed um revolve around water and you talked a lot about your process with photographing water um but we were wondering I guess, what brought you to the moment of wanting to start the whole series? Like what drew you especially to the idea of water and that specific natural environment? Um, a lot of my series actually, they don't, sometimes they, they start instinctively and it's like, my gut just drives me somewhere and I cannot fully understand why until it has happened several times. So I, began photographing water and then it was until later in which I stopped and reflected I'm like why do I keep coming back to these water uh sites and and where is this coming from and I think in the last years at the, like simultaneously I sort of embarked on a more let's say spiritual journey. And then I realized I had a kind of like a spiritual connection to water. And it's very ironic because I grew up on an island, but I never had a relationship with water. I grew up in a city that had no coast around it. For me, water was just something that was, I don't know if I took it for granted, but I just, I never, it was just, yeah, I didn't have a deeper connection to it. It was just almost something of leisure, but nothing of substance. Um, and as I grew older and sort of embarked in a more like discover the sort of spiritual connection to, to water, I understood that I felt the most connected and the most at home, not necessarily, I don't need to be immersed in water. Like I could be in a tiny boat, a wooden boat in the middle of Lake Victoria and is Africa. And I will feel like I'm touching God. Like I will, that is I'm the most centered I feel. And then I just felt, yeah, like floating, not in the literal sense, but just a sense of fluidity. And I wanted to translate that into other people, not just me, and sort of use it as the backdrop and like the stage. Um, yeah, I could only hope that it could bring some of that to my subjects and they could um, feel like they could disarm themselves and just forget about like facades and, um, and they could just be. And it's interesting because some people that I've photographed are water people. By that, I mean, they live by a coast, they live by a lake, they interact with it on a daily basis. So it's interesting to see those who are very comfortable around it. And those who already have a very distinct relationship to it, and some that actually fear it. <laughs> And it has been an interesting journey to see their individual interactions with it and capturing that. And, and the water has been sort of, yeah, it has just allowed me to, if I create a space for them to show some vulnerability, the water has added to that space of let's relax, let's breathe and let's be here now and let's be present. Um, so I th that's where that comes from. It's hoping that it creates this allowance for people to, to be. 
Yeah, I feel like you see a lot of trust in those photos. Mm. Um, like they shed all the walls around them. Mm. Um, but like, I was like thinking actually because of the pandemic, human interactions are now different. And I feel like now people are like putting those walls back up again. Mm. And you said you had to um, switch locations for your last series. Like, do you feel like the pandemic has kind of changed the way you interact with your subjects um, while photographing? Um, I would have to disagree a little bit. I think that there are some people who have more walls up. I think that mm -hmm. the opposite is happening to other people. I think that they're more honest. I think that they are more okay with being vulnerable. I think that they are more in touch with themselves and some of them are more in touch with nature. So I think that if anything, um, they're a bit more raw, some of them. And I think that is, or they're also more appreciative. There's almost like a celebratory element about, and for me has been truly like a joy and a celebration of just being and being able to go outside and shoot and connect. Um, so I think there's a gratefulness in it as well. Um, so that has been a beautiful part of the process. I think there's an appreciation for, for being able to do it and also for, for just being. So I think in a way, emotionally, I think I, I like for the, <laughs> in this context, I think it has allowed for a little bit more rawness in a good way, not necessarily in a bad way with some people and especially my subjects, not for everyone, but yeah. That's true. Yeah, it's beautiful to think of it that way. Um, I'm an optimist, so I think about yeah. like, I'm always <laughs> looking, it's like, where's the beauty in this? And that's like my constant, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's ideal to be an optimist, especially like in these times. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're nearing the last 10 minutes of yeah. this session. Um, so I just wanted to ask the audience um, again, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. I'm going to um, address like two of the questions. I think they're both sent in by BC. And the first one is if you sell prints of your work, they say they're obsessed with your images um, to let them know how they can be in touch to inquire. Um, yeah, they can just either email me, they can go to my Instagram, they can actually just DM me or email me. Um, and they will find my email should be on my bio, but the, also they can just, mm -hmm. I can say it here. It's Denise with two S's, so D-E-N-I-S-S-E -S -S -E dot P-R-E-Z. So it's like Perez without the first E at gmail.com. But oh. they can just reach out to me on Instagram and then I can give them my email and I think it should be there on my bio too. Um, the next question is what's on the horizon? Do you have plans yet for what your next series will be? Uh, well, now I'm turning this, I just finished, I literally finished shooting for the water series for the, mm -hmm. this Monday, like literally oh, okay. like last Monday. Um, and it's gonna be my first photo book. So I'm working on, yeah, like it felt like this entire wonderful journey, but now it's time to actually birth it. And the, that is a very interesting process. Um, so that is what's coming next. It's uh, actually turning, the, turning it into an actual, tangible object <laughs> wow that's gonna be so beautiful i can't wait to see the book when it comes out how long do these sorts of things take to get released um well it depends i mean this one is going to be i'm doing a collaboration with a, a design studio in london and so it's more about and also has been an organic process i thought i was done <laughs> and then the right person came and I was like I need to shoot this person for this so I added to it but I think um 
now it will start the design process and then it's going to be partly self-funded so it's going to be first i think um we're going to put it on a kickstarter and then we're going to actually print it awesome well, also be more environmentally conscious and just printing what it's in demand yes very good well we're, we're following you now so we'll <laughs> definitely stay up to date with the book and its release and just thank you both so much for your time this morning or evening as the case may be and especially thank you denise for sharing your work with us um, and talking to us about you know the backstory um really interesting information and um, the way you see the world is just so beautiful so thank you for sharing with us thank you thank you for having me and thank you to everyone who joined us this program has been recorded it will be available next week on our instagram and on the fowler website for you to revisit and share thank you everyone i hope that you will join us again soon uh, have a great weekend.